Jesus said to his disciples, When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, he will sit upon his glorious throne, and all the nations will be assembled before him, and he will separate them one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. A stranger, and you welcomed me. Naked, and you clothed me. Ill, and you cared for me. In prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? When did we see you ill or in prison and visit you? And the king will say to them in reply, Amen, I say to you, whatever you did for the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you accursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. A stranger, and you gave me no welcome. Naked, and you gave me no clothing. Ill and in prison, and you did not care for me. Then they will answer and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or ill or in prison and not minister to your needs? He will answer them, Amen, I say to you, whatever you did not do for one of these least ones, you did not do for me. And these will go off to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. I have had this little crucifix for over 20 years. Every morning when I first wake up, I kiss it and say, Christ our King, your kingdom come. Same thing when I lay down at night. Christ our King, your kingdom come. This little daily ritual with the crucifix is one of the customs of the Regnum Christi movement. Regnum Christi means kingdom of Christ. Everyone knows that we read the same Sunday readings on a cycle of how many years, correct? Three years. Six cycles ago on Christ the King Sunday 2002, we celebrated a large mass for the members of the Regnum Christi movement at the Basilica of the National Shrine in Washington, D.C. The Archbishop celebrated the mass. The seminarian who was a deacon chanted the gospel reading, same gospel reading as this Sunday, the separation of the sheep from the goats in Matthew 25. Father Marcial Maciel founded the Regnum Christi movement. He turned out to have been a serial sexual predator, protected for decades by higher-ups in the church. He victimized countless people and ruined many, many lives. The archbishop who celebrated the Regnum Christi Mass at the shrine in Washington, Christ the King Sunday, 2002, Theodore McCarrick, the deacon who chanted the gospel, me. In the gospel passage, Lord Jesus invites the sheep into the kingdom of heaven 
They have been kind to the weak and the suffering. They have acted humbly and gently towards everyone. They're surprised when the king beckons them because they never thought of themselves as anything great. They lived obscure lives of daily kindness. Maybe you know that the Vatican published a McCarrick report last week for 30 years, the higher ups in the church covered up for him. They left us seminarians, young priests, young people at risk. They knew that McCarrick posed a serious danger to us. They did nothing about it. On that Christ the King Sunday, 2002, when McCarrick and I stood next to each other at the altar in that huge church filled with eager Christians, that day, the higher-ups already knew all about him. McCarrick had already destroyed a lot of lives. The Pope knew it. Cardinals and bishops knew it. They did not think of the suffering wounded. They thought only about their own reputation. They had comfortable lives with servants at their beck and call. They wanted it to stay that way. It never so much as crossed their minds to seek out the lost souls who, whose lives McCarrick had destroyed. Most of the prelates who knew the dirty secret hated McCarrick, not because of what he had done to the defenseless, innocent people, but because of the danger he posed to, to the stability of their own coddled lives. They just wanted everyone to shut up about the whole thing. What if the king were to say to the goats before he sends them to hell, a sexual predator manipulated, demeaned, and abused me, and you did not care. A powerful church careerist crushed my faithful, innocent soul, and you worried about your own reputation. I tried to tell you that this man is a dangerous criminal, and you said it was all my fault. The predator threw me out on the street for refusing to give in to his advances, and I appealed to you. You never even wrote me back. Now, my printout of the McCarrick Report appears to be missing the last page. The page where they all say, we are terribly sorry. We clearly do not know what we are doing. We have wronged the innocent and defenseless victims for decades, turning a deaf ear to their cries, treating them as the problem. We still have no earthly idea how to handle what they say. We have failed you, dear, earnest Christians. You deserve much braver, more honest leaders. I cannot tell you how much it hurts to think about that Christ the King Sunday 18 years ago, this Sunday. And now that I know how the hierarchy betrayed us, they betrayed all of us who were there because we kiss our crucifixes every morning and every night and we long to get to heaven and we just want to treat everyone kindly. We're no saints, no heroes, but we would have known what to do with McCarrick if we had the information and the power. The hierarchy offers excuses rather than take responsibility. The McCarrick report is 449 pages of it's someone else's fault. No churchman has ever been willing to own the McCarrick problem, not for the past 35 years and not now. What if the king says, I came looking for encouragement in living an upright, responsible life, and you passed the buck. I needed someone to give me an example of courage, and you called a lawyer to protect yourself from liability. I came to church hoping to find someone who believes enough in Christ crucified to admit his sins, and you insisted that you have no memory of any conversation having to do with this issue. I'm going to keep kissing my crucifix and celebrating my mass. We live in dark, dark days for the church of Jesus Christ, for our church. Let's hold on to our faith and just keep trying to live in the truth.